Hello, everyone, and welcome to Performance Anxiety's 30th online reading event. My name is Tom Snarsky. I'm so excited to be with you this evening among this stellar group of readers we have for you tonight. Asparagus is running into the room because he's really excited that you're here with us as well. Um, in case you haven't listened in before, Performance Anxiety is an online reading series hosted via Skype, usually on the third Thursday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. We are going to mess with that schedule schedule a little bit because the best things in life are unexpected or something, you know, and uh, we'll talk about that in a few minutes or towards the end of our reading. Um, but each of, at each of our events, we normally feature as many as 10 readers to share a selection of their writing with us. Having all these slots every month means we're always looking for folks who'd be interested in reading. So if you are or know a poet or writer who'd be interested in sharing their work at a future event, please get in touch with us. Um, if anything we've said so far feels like, you know, you or a friend could read some stuff for us, um, you're welcome to reach out via the Performance Anxiety Twitter account, which is at Performance A-N-X-T on Twitter, or you can DM us the co-organizers directly. I'm at Tom Snarsky on Twitter and Instagram, T-O-M-S-N-A-R-S-K-Y, um, or you can email me at Tom Snarsky, same spelling, at gmail.com, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, you can also get in touch with Kristen Garth, who's Performance Anxiety, other co-organizer and founder, who I'm excited to introduce as our first asterisk uh, reader of the evening, because Kristen's usually or sometimes our first reader of the evening, but we actually kind of have a zeroth reader of the evening who I'm very excited to introduce, and that is Winston Garth. Um, and let me read Winston's bio before Winston shares a poem with us. Winston Garth is seven years old and is learning about poetry and ghosts. He had his first Starbucks reading Tuesday. So Winston, we're very excited you can join us after your Starbucks reading. I'm gonna mute and then share your poem so that everybody can read it while you read it for us. Okay, okay, go ahead. If all the ghosts ate hot dogs, we would be in a lot of trouble. Slimer is the strongest ghost. Hot dogs give them big muscles. Other ghosts are soft often. They are stuck in traps. Slimer escapes two traps. Other ghosts waste their intensity haunting. Slimer breaks into hot dog place as places as soon as he escapes. That's why Slimer is the only ghost worth the credit. Is rolling. <laughs> Yay! Why am I off the screen? You did a good job. Thank you so much, Winston, for kicking <laughs> off this 30th performance anxiety extravaganza. That again was Winston Garth, who is not only a first time poet, but also an established public poet. Um, read that poem, I believe, at a Starbucks table to an open audience, just kind of wanted to share some poetry with them. Um, I think and Kristen can uh, elucidate this story a little, a little better than I can, I think. But, you know, unfortunately, we're not the premier audience, but it's still a very exciting poem. And we were very, very happy to uh, have Winston be able to share it with us. Um, and in you know very very due and appropriate follow-up form i'm really excited to introduce our you know first second i don't know reader of the evening and that was Kristen garth who is uh you know helping with the technical end of uh, of winston's reading and Kristen garth is a pushcart wrestling nominated sonneteer and a best of the net 2020 finalist her sonnets have stocked journals like Glass, Yes, 521, Luna, Luna, and more. She's the author of 23 books of poetry, including Candy Cigarette Woman Child Noir from Hedgehog Poetry Press. You'll hear more about Hedgehog very soon. Um, and Atheist Barbie from Maverick Duck Press. She's the founder of Pink Plastic House, a tiny journal, and co-founder of Performance Anxiety, this very online poetry reading series. So, Kristen, thank you very much um, for joining us. And feel free to, uh, you know, add any details I forgot about the uh, the Winston saga. Oh, I think you are muted right this moment, though. For my Pink Plastic House Poetry Journal, we've been counting down um, the days to Halloween and poetry, and I'm, you know, it, we started at 91 days, and so I've been, it's been a, you know, struggle because I don't want to repeat people and whatever, and Winston asked to write a poem for it, and that was his first poem, so anyway, now he wanted to perform it, so that's the story of that, but if you have a poem yourself that you want to send to the um, Poetry Countdown, um, you can send it to pinkplastichouse at gmail.com, and we'll be doing that every day. I'm publishing somebody every day until Halloween, but 
in the meantime, um, I am going to be reading today from my own book, which is the uh, newest book, which is The Death of Alice in Wonderland. And it has a lot to do with, um, I would say, sex and death poetry of aging woman child. And um, anyway, I'm going to start with a poem that's a Twin Peaks poem that I wrote called Your Father Buys a Pony, But Not for You for Audrey Horn and Laura Palmer. Girls working at counters often daydream. You clutch a tree printed sweater, finger seams like lines of rough hands. Desire is a scheme. Men buy bad girls ponies, muffle their screams. Cream colored creatures you cannot abide. Only soon to be dead girls dare to ride. Two toe-headed manes men spot easily in the dark. Death, a pale horse, awaiting menarch. Anarchy, it makes a female lives in puberty when friends become a father's fantasy. And I'm totally changing up, but I'm just going to read. So <laughs> and here, um, next I'm going to read a poem called Boy with the Head of a Hair. I met a boy with a head of a hair, waistcoat, knee breeches, powder white whiskers that would wiggle in profile, debonair. His white gloved hand twined in mine through snickers and stairs. We raced through wrought iron gates of the village at dusk. They will tell tales of the two of us, speculating our fate, his anatomy, an imagined love child of ignominy, who might be the gold teeny bunny with strange sapphire eyes, who stalks the gardens of a family I now despise. His ears pivot toward lies as he whisks me into a hole somewhere to love a boy with a head of a hair. And last couple of poems I'm going to read are a little bit darker, but... um. The first one's called, Your Guilt Glows in Bars Like Plastic Ceiling Stars. Lived through childhood without any physical scars, at least the kind sunshine outlines. But men all see them plain inside of any bar, skin map of zinc sulfide black light stars. When you sit near strangers in the dark with the thin mar marred arms of an easy mark, they see their way straight inside, vulnerabilities you cannot hide, behind your prim, pretty sundress. They know you honor all requests, in parking lots, alleys, suburban woods. You speak fluently their faux incest, a baby face though they know you're no good. You pass for innocent on sunny streets, and they will punish you for this deceit. And the last one I'm going to read is called Bubblegum. I play these same games since I turn 18. The rules evolve in ways I don't choose. Each time I say daddy, things become more extreme. I find a way to retain innocence to lose. I spread my legs for cameras on stage. Still, I cannot look these men in their eyes. My birthday does not reflect my mental age. They call me on apps to make me cry. I hide my pastel knives near my Barbie dolls. Pink walls requested with the reddest of welts. I swallow anything that will keep me small. I suffocate doubt with a tight leather belt. After they come, I pretend to be numb. A hard candy shell over bubble gum. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was Kristen Garth, Performance Anxieties co-founder and co-organizer, who you can find on Twitter at Lola and Jolie, L-O-L-A-A-N-D-J-O-L-I-E. And you can follow Kristen's many pursuits on her website, which is Kristen Garth, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-G-A-R-T-H dot com. Kristen's involved in lots of amazing projects. There's Pink Plastic House, where you can read um, Winston's poem, but then there's also, uh, I know that the 
a Twin Peaks anthology just became free online to read as a as a an ebook, so you can read the Twin Peaks poems there. And also, Kristen co-edited the uh, Wikipedia project, the Wickerman tribute. Um, the Daily Drunk did as well, which is also super rad. So there's just lots of amazing stuff. And if like me, your head is spinning with how much with Kristen's pro prolificacy, keep an eye on it at kristengarth.com. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce our next reader, and that is Amy Pogue. Amy Pogue lives in Iowa and holds an MA in creative writing from Eastern Michigan University. Her work has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and has appeared in Swim Every Day, Figure One, The Indianapolis Review, Rogue Agent, Stirring a Literary Collection, and others. She can be found at amypogue.wordpress.com, which is A-M-Y-P-O-A-G-U-E.wordpress.com, and on Twitter at Pogue Amy. Um, Amy, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to hear the poems you're going to share, and I'll pull them up for everybody to follow along with in just a moment. Thank you so much, Tom. I'm so excited to be a part of this tonight. I'm going to switch over to my poem screen. Um, all of these poems can be found linked from my website, which Tom just mentioned. And I'm just going to get started. There are five of them. The first one is called Nightmare Group Archery Mishap Necessitates Big Ass. Truly, you are a certain height. I am a different height. Also, I am not you. You are a little taller, so I can lean in. For my story, I got arrows stuck in my shoulder. Why wouldn't arrows give me direction? And ran in circles, trying to hide them with my linty cardigan. One of us said our dreams were the right height for each other. One of us said warmly, you're so me, like it was a comprehensible statement. Somehow I try to avoid needing you, even if I am dreaming, even if there are no stakes to needing, but I didn't have any better ideas, couldn't, ha couldn't keep teaching archery or telling tall tales without different hands reaching in, asking what gave me direction to next give me mercy. Next poem is called, I Could Work in a Cube This Small in an Office. Pendants dangled in the window, sparkling glass, color in cubes. I needed a new life to gift myself a necklace. My office cubicle hung gray against my chest during the hours I continued living. Tacking up souvenirs, watercolors, sketches of trees provided a chance I hadn't had yet, making space pleasant. But the watercolors waved and smiled from there away, wherever they would be happier. The cube of aqua glass and a silver chain were mine before I could find another job. Giving up on deserving a glittering endeavor was the easy part. Okay. Up next is called Pulling Yourself Together is Pseudoscientific. Reconstituting the curling memory of my smallest, youngest hands can feel like a connect the dots with a real pencil problem. Yet a friend describes a healer using energetic stitches, sewing up her own facial wound with invisibly wending love. The concern I have. The world would like me pulled together, provides only suture thread. This enfleshment of all others requests a smile or else. But my lips are already loosening to fragments inside the paint by numbers of their tremble. Great. My fourth poem is called Any Day Now, Aliveness. It's slightly more up you might say. Let me try to have this lined up here. Oops. Oh dear. Sorry, y'all. Okay. Any day now, aliveness. I used to ask, how would a dead person see this desk job? But then it didn't help being dead. 
I remember waking up happy one time that year. Mnemonic devices don't lift the other heavy mornings. Still, my future came to introduce itself one day, an inverted memory. My path coming to meet me made me feel oddly loved, while I dressed only because I was awake. I was loved until 3 p.m., when my mind took over. Reggie Biv, the acronym that holds rainbows, proof the mind can hold them too. I sent this mnemonic ahead of me to the love that came for me. Right before I quit, a walking bridge on my morning commute woke up painted in rainbows. The past blurred and softened, became a memory trick. Any day now, aliveness might intervene to surprise. Finally, my fifth and last poem is called The Before World, Writing the Bluest Line Through an Archive of Sky. After the geodesic dome designed by R. Buckminster Fuller, now known as the Montreal Biosphere. I go to my happy place inside color theory, inside the theory explaining color afternoon, a geodesic dome, preparations for Expo 67. I'm not alive yet. This afternoon, my fellow and concept enthusiasts and I cheer for colorless acrylic cells between our conceptual faces and what we understand as the bluest sky. Later, the cells will catch fire. For now, my humanity remains theoretical. My happy place predates the dome, the buckyball, predates the sky. I go there sleepy happy, writing an imaginary blue line from the Ontario Pavilion. I go there almost alive. That's all. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Kristen. I'm switching back to the call screen here. Thank you so much, Amy, for sharing those five poems with us. And I'm thinking about, I, I was cheating. I was trying to stop sharing early so I could go back to that line from your first one where it's, it's one of us said our dreams were the right height for each other. That just like, yeah. That's beautiful. Um, and that again was Amy Pogue, who you can find on Twitter one more time, at Pogue Amy, so P-O-A-G-U-E-A-M-Y uh, on Twitter. And also keep an eye out, Amy has poems forthcoming in Guesthouse and in Juked Online. So keep an eye out for those. They'll be really exciting to, to read and we look forward to seeing them. And uh, I'm just gonna, I might've muted somebody there. Sorry if I did that, but um, I, Unfortunately, um, our next reader who was posted, um, Nisha Trout, can't make it tonight. She's actually recovering from uh, shot number two of the COVID vaccine situation, but she will be joining us in our next reading in September. We'll talk more about when that'll be um, at the end of the reading. So we're going to jump ahead to our, our next reader, who I'm very excited to introduce, uh, and that is Kevin A. Risner. Kevin A. Risner is an Ohioan. He is the author of Do Us a Favor from Variant Literature in 2021. His work has also recently been published or is forthcoming in the Aurora Journal, Lucent Dreaming, The Ocean State Review, CP Quarterly, and Moonchild Magazine. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin, for being here. I'm just going to pull your poems up in one second and I'll mute so you can take it away. All right, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to um, share my uh, poems with you today. Um, all the poems that I'm going to be sharing are from Do Us a Favor, which uh, you can pre-order um, now. Uh, the books will be sent out at the end of this month, so I'm really excited that everyone will be able to get their hands on, on this book very soon. So yeah, I'm going to be reading four poems right now. And um, the first one <clears throat> was initially published by Rising Star Review quite a few years ago, actually. And so this is a, an updated version of that poem, um, and it's, it finds it's a, a spot near to the beginning uh, of the collection. So um, it's titled, When I See My Wife. <clears throat> when I see my wife, eyed suspiciously by an agent at the airport, 
because of her last name. I want to speak up and yell back. Do you really think she has something in her shoe to detonate when we're high in the air? But I say nothing. We stand and wait. We blister with anger. A name from somewhere over there elicits fear, some dormant poison set to ruin one's life. The watchdogs bark, saliva splatters in all directions because the tiniest of mice have darted into view. I want to say something in this TSA line. I'm going to say something this time. I truly am going to, I'm going to, I am. But I say nothing. We open our pockets, take off shoes, plop belts onto the conveyor belt, flash our laptops for all to see, allow others to roll their hands up and down our bodies, just in case, just in case, just in fucking case. All right. The next poem is um, a little bit, I don't want to say more lighthearted, but um, I feel a lot more buoyant after um, kind of looking over this poem and reading over it so many times. Um, it kind of has this kind of futuristic vibe to it. It's called, If There Is No More Electricity. <clears throat> if there is no more electricity, do this. Before the final surge comes, print out my words. Press every line onto my tongue. Stamp the ink there. The paper will disintegrate. I'll swirl it around like an oaky Shiraz and ingest the pages I have left. Each letter and diacritic will remain a part of me for years and years until my cells replenish. I'll, con I'll construct an encyclopedia much larger than my initial meal of words and phrases and paragraphs and chapters. This is only a preventative measure to consume everything before the powers that be bring torches and ignite what's left, to savor the sweetness each character holds before the ink sinks into ash, soon to nothing. Flames lick the pulp and splinters of fallen earth and beauty. Make these words brighter than any bonfire, brighter than the sun, ballooning into the world, setting off sprinkler systems. Okay. Um, the next poem here is a little bit different. Um, so this one is the kind of where I got the title from my upcoming chat book. And it was um, inspired by the telephone call between Donald Trump and the Ukrainian president. And after kind of exploring the actual transcript, I constructed an erasure poem that was published in Glass Poetry um, in December of 2019, ages ago, and it was the inspiration for this entire chapbook. Um, and so I'm going to be reading all of the um, pages that are interspersed throughout this book. So all of it's kind of merged together in this one document here, but they kind of find their way throughout um, on all black page with white lettering. So it kind of offsets the other poems. So it's not really, there's no real title. So I just use the, the title of the book for the, the, the title here. I had an opportunity to learn from you. It is true. These were unique elections. I would like you to do us a favor though. Surround yourself with the same people. Nonsense ended. A lot of it started. Whatever you do, it's important you do it. Ready to open a new page. I wanted to, to reassure you we are friends. A lot of people are talking. Restore honesty. If you have information, it would be very helpful to make sure we administer justice. Thank you for your invitation. 
the whole world was upset. All right. And my last poem, um, it's kind of near the end, and I think it's a really good bookend for this, um, this reading. Um, it's originally published by Per Happened Mag last year. Um, it's one of my favorite poems that I've had published. Um, and there are lyrics from this poem that were um, from two songs on the Nationals most recent album, which you can see the title is one of the names of their songs. So, um, so yeah, you had your soul with you. Mine hung on the flagpole when the temperature reached 90 degrees for three days straight again. You have no idea how hard I died when you left. The back seat is lined with towels, dried leaves on the floor, towers of library books I haven't read, never will. Where do passengers go for respite? A seat at the bar with a beer and a glass to inspect the counter for hidden grime? There's always a recounting of the past decade, a lazy day parade, a sham election. I was in no mood to hear this. Strings of lyrics pausing in the sky, wait for change, that won't come. There's wait before sleep, in the pain, in the middle of a fork in the road, at a wrong turn. There's heartbreaking truth in the raspiest of voices, love submerged with an underwater chorus. Vibrating light emanates from our chests. I gasp as this one song pauses at the bridge. It crawls and peeks over the edge into the river. Maybe souls can be moved here at the end of everything. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Kevin, for that showstopper of the conclusion to that set. That was Kevin Risner, whose poems I'm slowly trying only to disappear from the screen so that you can go find them in his forthcoming chapbook, which again is coming out from Variant Literature so, so soon. It is titled Do Us a Favor, and you can pre-order it already at variantlit.com slash product slash do hyphen us hyphen a hyphen favor. And if you want to follow um, not only the release of Kevin's chapbook, but also his other future work, you can find him on Twitter at Mr. Underscore December. So M-R underscore D-E-C-E-M-B-E-R. And then on Instagram at Kevin A. Risner, which is Kevin A. K-E. V-I-N-A-R-I-S-N-E-R. -E um, and then KevinARisner.com is another place where you can find all of Kevin's work. Right, and so you. without, yeah, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate having you on. And without any further ado, it's actually kind of snuck up on me because um, we have quite a few readers who are going to be sharing uh, their work with us um, in recording form as uh, you know we have some readers who were not able to make it to our July UK performance anxiety um, so it's 2 a.m. around or so there now so they're going to be sharing recordings in a few minutes but um, before that happens we are really happy to have one more live and in-person reader um, to share uh, their work with us right this moment and that is Jane Rebecca Canarella. Jane Rebecca Canarella is a writer and editor living in Philadelphia. She is the editor of Hoot Review and Meow Meow Pow Pow Lit and a former genre editor at Lunch Ticket. She's the author of Better Bones and Marrow, both published by 30 West Publishing House, um, The Guessing Game, published by BA Press, Thirst and Frost, forthcoming from Vegetarian Alcoholic Press, and 1100, forthcoming from Really Serious Lit. So Jane Rebecca is joining in the, uh, the great performance anxiety spirit of incredible prolificacy. Um, she likes cats, thank God, because they keep walking into the frame here, candy, and getting eaten by the ocean. So thank you so much, Jamie, for being here with us tonight. Um, I'm really excited to hear what you're going to share. Hey, everyone. I am seriously hoping that I'm not lagging, so apologies if I do. Um, so I'm going to be reading a piece I just it into the um, document like not so long ago, but it's a longer piece. I'm only going to be reading one. And it was originally published in South Broadway Ghost Society. Um, if you haven't heard of them or submitted to them, I suggest you check them out. They're super rad. 
Uh, and it's called For Jay Who Didn't Get Cable Television Until He Was 13 and Also Thinks I'm Petty. For Jay Who Didn't Get Cable Television Until He Was 13 and Also Thinks I'm Petty. And how I made fun of how he first experienced the joy that comes with cable, like placing melted snow between tart teeth and getting the phantom taste of salt from the sky or for some truck more likely. But it's cool because it's good anyway. It's the propulsion of quickly falling ice crystals and thunder from the sky that now lives inside him. Anyone can be part of the Earth's outer atmosphere, and this is the closest to becoming a cosmic being that Jay's ever been. And he and I are acting like those two stars in our galaxy who have begun behaving strangely, a cool giant and a relatively hot white dwarf, a stellar corpse. Outbursts of energy like when he couldn't stay seated and was asked to sit in the corner during middle school because he was being disruptive. Now we're both warm movement and icy at the same time and are filled with the need to rattle the desktop as the universe cycles through us. And with images being spoon fed through eyeballs for so many years, it's like he's growing and cooling at the same time. Maybe I am too. There is the terror of so many choices, like the fear of being in the middle of the crosswalk when an ambulance is coming, silenced and stricken. And how do you run to safety when your feet are stuck to the blacktop? With every fuzzy sound augmented and amplified as animated figures grow and lean, continually expanding, cable television is communicating with the divided sky and directly into every and any TV watcher, but him especially. Jay could and can sit and watch the bleary movements, and he knew and knows that the universe keeps growing. And when he was just 13, he had eaten Christmas and July snowflakes, the light changing across wavelengths, both astronaut and astronomer, and he got cable, and because of that, parts of him live in solar systems light years away, waiting to fall back to Earth. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Thank you so much, Jane, for sharing that beautiful piece with us. Um, and that, again, was Jamie. Oh, sorry, I lied for a second. That's Jane Rebecca Canarella. So Jane, if Jane Rebecca was worried about lagging, and I'm the one who's doing all the lagging here tonight. Um, and Jane Rebecca Canarella, you can find on the socials at another intro. So A N O T H E R I N T R O. Um, and check out all of the involved, all the publications that Jane Rebecca is involved with, um, including Hoot Review, Meow Meow, Pow Pow Lit, and Screenshot Lit. And then there's also um, Thirst and Frost that's forthcoming for vegetarian. Tarian Alcoholic Press and 1100 forthcoming from Really Serious Lit. So it's a really exciting time. Um, lots of amazing projects from all our readers coming out. So we strongly encourage you to check those out. So now I'm excited to transition into the portion of our reading that consists of readers who are contributing via recording. So we had a few readers who couldn't make this particular time uh, or in a place where the time zone difference would have been um, a big leap or that, you know, we're in the woods and the Wi-Fi is not so good in the woods as I am learning uh, here. Um, but our first reader who is sharing a recording with us, and who I'm excited to share that recording on behalf of, is Jake Byrne. And Jake Byrne is a poet and writer based in Tuckeronto. We're very happy to have Jake back, and here is his recording. Hey, Tom, Christy, and everybody else at uh, Performance Anxiety. I am recording this from a cabin with no Wi-Fi in Northern Ontario, Canada. Um, and I'm just came from the gym and have to go to my partner's parents' anniversary dinner. So forgive me for being both sweaty and kind of frazzled. Uh, it's really nice to be here. I wish I could be with, here with you in person and I will be next month. Um, but it's very nice to be part of Performance Anxiety again. Tom, I've been loving your book. Thank you so much for my copy of it. I'm gonna read quickly. Um, content warnings for my stuff. Uh, lots of gay sex, usually some salty gay language. Um, drug use, mental illness stuff. Ah, okay. I really hope I haven't read this one before. If it is, maybe we can just cut that out. This one is called Saturday Night's All Right for Fisting, and it was in Underblong magazine a couple months ago. Saturday Night's All Right for Fisting. 
Whatever I did to deserve the phantom of the opera, earwormed on my commute to work, I renounce. Locust bean pods rot underfoot, soggy cigarette butts, curtain of cleansing rains, street lights, the full moon in pavement puddles, trying to consecrate the images in time from the weekend at the bathhouse. So sing for me, angel of music and memory. Ed said he wasn't on the path he saw for himself at 30. The path in which a muscled boy named Ed with cum gutters, the sort of blue eyes many people would die for, if not me, gives me the time of day, gives me his cock forcefully into my uvula. That's not the path I saw for myself either, and the price I pay for it is dear. For someone whose early life was organized around unrequited desire, now that I can reach out my desire and be met on its terms by the object of it, my brain is screaming. Can't you see? I am unlovable, unfuckable. Mounting my asshole on a plinth in the bathhouse, throng of men, an arc of lightning chaining through our navels, chemicals singing coloratura in our bodies. This is the desire that others us, but unites us secure in our desires. One multitude, one purpose. The games we play the straight world cannot credit for. They do not understand what it means to walk the forking path. How old were you when you first realized that time was just a shadow on a wall? How long have I sat vigil at the altar of the God who comes and promises all the experience that a human life can bear? The only requirement that you surrender yourself utterly to him. Naked, oiled with sweat, drunk on the maenad's wine, all the witches in the corner disassociating. The hole without me that leads within. The way the world enters it by force. The way I give it up to it. The agape of all my brothers at the orgy. The love of God threatening. To Kool-Aid man through the blasted world and rip all its painted backdrops. Thank you. Hello again. There was a knock at the door. I have another poem. Also, I shouted out Christy, who is Tom's wife, and I meant to shout out Kristin. Hey, Kristin. Sorry. Second poem is called Sigil of the Empty Throne. I took that title from a Magic the Gathering card. Sigil of the Empty Throne. Our intentions do not sprout green from the ground. They are the seeds we plant under a layer of mulch. I cannot say what it is that comes up in spring after the thaw of rust and stink. Meet me in the dead winter forest, the grove of trees asleep. Nine sticks crossed before your feet. I cannot let you get near to me. And I am lonely. I do not deny it. I cannot deny it. Is the line I actually wrote. Who rules o'er all in the wood? Save sin. Let him in. Let him in. Who cares for the roots when the soil grows cold? Nine trees in a ring. Bars of a cage for the mind's hands to hold. Where do the plague of grackles go when they're gone? The world turns and the soil clings on. That's all for tonight.
Hope you all have a wonderful time. Looking forward to seeing you next time. See ya on the internet. Love you. Thank you so much, Jake. That was Jake Byrne, uh, Phantom of the Opera, Wink and all. Um, and again, Jake Byrne is a poet and writer based in Tuckeronto. You can find Jake's work on Twitter at Jake Byrne Writes, J-A-K-E-B-Y-R-N-E-W-R-I-T-E-S. Um, you can also follow Jake's website, which is www.jakebyrnewrite.es. So Jake Byrne, W-R-I-T dot E-S. Um, our next reader, who I'm excited to introduce, is one of the readers who um, couldn't make it to our last Performance Anxiety UK event last month, but um, we're very happy to have this time, and that is Pratiba Castle. Pratiba Castle is an Irish-born poet living in England. Her award-winning debut pamphlet, A Triptych of Birds and a Few Loose Feathers, from Hedgehog Poetry Press, publishes in 2021. Her work appears in Agenda, Panoply, HU, Blue Nib, and more. Highly in various poetry competitions, she readers regularly on The Poetry Place. So thank you, Pratiba. I'm excited to share the recording of Pratiba's poems in just one moment. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be reading for you this evening. Many thanks to Tom Snarsky. I'm going to read a couple of poems from my forthcoming award-winning debut pamphlet, A Triptych of Birds and a Few Loose Feathers, published by Hedgehog Poetry Press and coming out shortly. Um, I will also read uh, a couple of new poems. Wild Lass of Kells. She shuffles on the curb outside O'Shaughnessy's corner of Kelly and Dunleven Road. Her eyes, the colour of Our Lady's veil, scorched bluer by her copper curls. On the lookout for the da, her task of a Friday night to wheedle the wages off of him before he sets out on the lash. Glad of a break from the chores, Socks like a flock of crows forever jostling. Hand-me-down frocks in need of hems. Pants snagged on barbed wire, nails atop of farmers' walls and fences. Herself, the first born of a baker's dozen. Endless mopping up of spats, snail snots, scabby porridge pots. Licks of laughter, yellow light, sidle out the gaping door into the night, let out by coaches on their shuffle to the bar. Egypts with purple slurs for eyes, glances tossed her way, collection plate clink of small change at Sunday mass. The odd time a flash of lust, the most times shame. A rare smile to build her up. Sure, aren't you a dot now, Delia, looking out for your mammy? God bless yourself. Eyes cast down, pious daughter of the Virgin. Lord love the child in her wilting dress, miraculous blue medal clipped to the chest of her tatty cardigan. An occasion of sin, to be sure Slovenes might take advantage of. Till she glances up. That glare, brazen as hell's fires, from the child of Mary of the Scry Eye, seventh daughter of a seventh son, flame hex of a wild blood tinker, skipping off home to a last scald of the pot, wedge of soda fall thick with dripping. Her pocket is a clatter of coins. Only the lighter by a bleary-eyed pint. Northern Fair. The cage dangles upside down on the tip of a tentacle, flung like a baby's arm to its steepest sprawl. It idles in the breeze, quivers, my knuckles white, tight with clutching the metal bar. A singe of sugar rises from the candy floss stand and axle grease. Woolworth's cheap scent shouts laughter, all the hurdy-gurdy grizzle of the fair. 
I breathe like sitting water in a drought, barely enough to keep me conscious, lest falling into a belly bloating whale, I lose my grip. How might it be to slip, soar, a swift inscribing secret? Or the blood clot that might have been you slipping out from between my legs to slump akimbo, a crooked star glinting in the churned up mud, essence seeping through jellyfish skin. My fingers tire, begin to fail, open, but the engine judders back to life. Cogs once smooth stutter me back to the start. I clamber out, stagger through quicksand crowds, my face a clown's mask. And though my lips curve upwards as if all this has been nothing more than a lark, my heart weeps clotted tears. Padraig who drove the snakes out of Ireland. At the allotment, Daddy forked the crumbly black earth till the air quaked with anticipation of excess, me sifting stones in search of treasure. The robin sat pert on the lip of the bucket meant to carry spuds or cabbages or the occasional giggle tickle carrot back to placate the mammy. The bird's eye bright with a lust for worms, his song a crystal cataract of merry. Though none of the seeds we sowed ever showed head out of the sly earth, and we saw nothing of the slow worm Daddy promised, so that his name being Padraig too, I guessed he must be a saint, especially when he himself vanished. Though he turned up months later at the end of school, again and again and again, till I had to tell the mammy where the books and toys came from, which got me sent away to board at St. Bridget's convent, where the head nun was nice to you, if your mammy gave her fruit cake in a tin, bottles of orange linked as sherry, a crocheted shawl like fruffy cobweb, none of which my mammy could afford, Padraig having banished more than snakes. And to finish up, a poem that looks back to the 60s in swinging London. The only one who loves you, spurning words that echoed like a curse. I stuffed a duffel bag with blister packs of pills, Mary Quant minis, fantasies of girls, threading daisies in the muzzles of guns, fled to the big smoke. In a bedsit by Kensington Gardens, I massacred steak with the mallet of hate, a year on turned vegan. Pioneer in 68 of pity for pool-eyed cows, sheep, slate, stare, place, feigned compassion. Strove to prove to myself that I was worthy of love. Strutted the nights away with flautists, a harpist whose healer's hands strummed my strings. Drummer his silk-tipped stroke nimble on the snare, callous guitarist plucking tunes from out of smoke drifts, chanted mantras with Ramdas in a basement in Notting Hill, dost in a maid of ale squat, candles, cower gas stove, the one tap drip, drip in the bog beside the back door made out off my head with a sweetheart leaf philodendron, burnt joysticks to placate Carly's hoard of swords, sweeten the vibes, man, stench of catlet, no one from the Highgate commune I crashed in next ever emptied. 
spooned marmalade from a jar half full, recycled from a skip, almost believed myself deserving of love, till come the morning I forgot. My heart tenderized with grief, discovering the night my mother died. Love is an ether you can choke or float in. Wow, I almost believe myself deserving of love till come the morning I forgot. That was Pratiba Castle, who you can find on the socials um, at Pratiba Castle. So on Twitter, it's P-R-A-T-I-B-H-A-C-A-S-T-L-E, and on Instagram. Um, Check out Pratiba's forthcoming award-winning debut pamphlet that is a triptych of birds and a few loose feathers from Hedgehog Poetry Press in 2021. Um, you can find Pratiba guesting on Meet the Poet as well, and you can keep track of all Pratiba's awesome poetry exploits at pratibacastlepoetry.wordpress.com, P-R-A-T-I-B-H-A-C-A-S-T-L-E, poetry.wordpress.com. And our very last reader also joining us via recording this evening, a poet I've admired for a long time, um, that is Maria Sledmere. And Maria Sledmere lives in Glasgow, Scotland. She's editor-in-chief of Spam Press and a member of A&E Collective. Her debut collection, The Luna Erratum, is forthcoming from Dostoevsky Wannabe, and I'm so excited for it. Maria is going to take it away in just one moment. Hi everyone, everyone in the future. It's great to be with you from the past. Um, I'm Maria Sledmere and I'm gonna read a couple of poems. Um, some of them are from a, a forthcoming collection called The Luna Erratum, um, which is gonna be published by Dostoevsky Wannabe very soon, hopefully in September. So if you like what you hear, I guess, keep an eye out for that one. Um, yeah. Livestream. A particular sap is in season. At night I am visited by fish, their tiny bodies pulled from a book. Explaining myself to myself, I would say, joy is so easily hallucinated. Couldn't load the page when I typed in river. You in your red coat watching the deer. Put ice cubes in the potted tree in your apartment. I differ in dreams from the eloquence begged, you don't reply. My skin is of love and salt. Connor says you have to go through your feelings. I am rolling my tarry dreams in the car park at the world's bright core. I am loved by mice, rarely men. I melt in drinks. Close your eyes and imagine a place. Oven baked, the sap was hot and thick, needed to sit. Six years ago, we almost commented. I will learn words that mean the length of such quiddity. This will be cut into coasters to settle a form of burning, say. Put down your glasses, software, mark my words. Cover us, covers us. All that I have is the currency of song, river run, rush into satures of future. The fish would leap and speak their research little bubbles we look up to smile at the others start to yelp cars are just things in the distance color to color signing off thank you to tom for having me um When is the best time to announce a floral pregnancy? A cube of dandelions weep in the open field, a lily in my belly. Do you remove a single bloom? Mother-in-law comes by in her customary pollen to call them weeds, which reminds you sneezingly of a childhood incident concerning the lovely clover brought home in bundles like, mum, I made us a lucky bouquet but anything might have been trash and crushed from suspicion, daughterly after. All the wild dandelions turn towards different suns is a wild explanation. 
Had I plucked each one, the way you look at four o'clock and turned complex ache with only the beautiful stems of your naming, worried a floret this all would collapse. Miles ago in chamomile loneliness, everything closes to sleep, every part useful. A catalogue of white flowering Japanese dandelion, endangered Californian dandelion, northern dandelion, Turkish dandelion, Russian dandelion, which produces rubber, red seeded dandelion, Korean dandelion, common dandelion found in many forms, the rare dandelion of St Kilda. Will I ever go there? Endemic to the area is also insomnia. Having assembled for you this sculpture, weeping milky latex, vomit a thought, called up lion's tooth care or piss a bed yellows. Every year Americans spend millions on lawn pesticides to have uniform lawns of non-native grasses, an effort which uses 30% of the water supply. Here are some useful facts. I guess I wrote quite a lot of anti-lawn poems and some of them are in this book. <laughs> um, The problem with indigo. The sky is a textile conglomerate. We bit a hole in the economic donut. At any moment, dreaming element or electrical storm of the movie, all the troposphere sewn to my tongue. Imagine if carbon came as soft serve. One of the ghosts was a polar thought and tasted of lyric. It split down the middle with cream and the earth was inside like the stone of a peach. Felt little buds in the cells of my blood. Exhalations of cloud vines anywhere. I wanted to pass a more decorative energy and I wanted to sleep forever until everything we did was undone as it was. Milking computer with the moon. Its iris became a rose in your eye and looped back into phantosmia, sequined the dark with notes of underripe banana, bergamot and petrichor, curing diacritics for breakfast, varnish, cash, the last of our futures scented. How to live now without drying the ice after party, towards which our bus heaved likeness tussocks, a snog of lost solarity, I wanted to enter with sincerity my hundreds and thousands, the M8 bridge to nowhere. So that's enough of Luna. Um, this is from a pamphlet that came out last year called Chlorophyllia, um, and the poem is called Glitch Meridian. Tree, you are so full of time, I can hardly see what's left of it, being this scorched, addressing the torso with oil's last postcode lottery. You wouldn't download a mew, but shinies are everywhere. Just ask pastoral. Friday, I check the news. Friday, I feel this is love. But how would I know when the glass is the glass, is the glass between us? All laudable scaffold. The world had died outside the world because of the weather. Blown sideways to such futures. And a poem begins with this inching through air with my sherbet detritus, trying to reach the luminous egress of hours erected, clicked to a locked conundrum. It's like, yeah, I already said you are so full of time and the blush insufflation of your sap is prime solution. Lowest zero in a blossom of jewelries. I want this to be natural, comfortable, sporadic. Whatever you want to open with, adore you. Adornment. Resist this spatial discrepancy. Exist to make leaf with me. And my last poem is from the first instalment of a project called Sonnets for Hooch, um, which is a four part pamphlet series um, written with my friends Carl Lovell and Mal Bayoko. Um, and it's seasonal, so this is the spring one. It's called Lemon Bloom Season. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, hooch is a kind of alcopop, um, but also has many other meanings that are worth researching. So, toxic hooch. Asphalt itself is my condolence, earth that I am never there to attribute. Almost the sour laurel, which does not care. A fit boy for borrowing celebrity tears I bottled remotely. 
congenital trembles return us to friction or grow luxurious with these bruises hydrangeas of stresses we speak stars to not touch each other's curls where no legal basis exists for disaster the mulch of a hooch had already left impressions on fresh surface a fast kiss the last she'll ever know or go southwest as she is prisoner wholeheartedly in lingerie break this glass free britney thanks Wow, all those dandelions. That was Maria Sledmere um, wrapping us up as our last reader of the evening, but don't sleep on Maria's book coming out very soon, The Luna Erratum from Dostoevsky Wannabe. And you can follow Maria on Twitter at Maria X Rose, M-A-R-I-A-X-R-O-S-E. On Twitter and on Instagram, you can follow Maria at cherry underscore melancholic. Um, also, a new collaboration, Sonnets for Hooch Summertime Social, is out now with Kyle Lovell's wonderful Fathom Sun Press. Um, so you can go to fathomsun.com, F-A-T-H-O-M-S-U-N.com, slash sonnets hyphen for hyphen hooch hyphen two. Um, yeah, just there's so much awesome stuff going on. And with Maria's blog, you can keep track of it too. That's at mariaology, which is M-A-R-I-A-O-L-O-G-Y yy.wordpress.com. So with that, and sadly, we have come to the conclusion of our reading for August of 2021, um, which was our 30th performance anxiety reading of all time, which is really exciting for us two years and a couple months into this series. Um, it's been amazing to hear all of these incredible readers and we just want to end by um, making a couple of quick remarks. So on the first uh, hand, thank you so much to our readers and contributors live and remotely um, for giving all of us, giving us, you know, the space to hear your work and get to know it. Um, you know, it's no small feat to get to read these poems live and so beautifully as you did or make those recordings and share those with us. Um, and also to thank our listeners, um, who many of whom I hope might be listening with like a sheaf of new poems close at hand or chapbook draft they're working on or something. So if that's you and you would like to consider dropping us a line, remember we are at Performance ANXT on Twitter, or you can just email me, tomsnarski at gmail.com. We would love to have you uh, at a future reading. Um, our next reading, we normally have our readings on the third Thursday of every month, but uh, as it happens, that will be the weekend that my sister is getting married in September. So I will be in Oklahoma officiating that wedding, which I'm very nervous about. So I will have performance anxiety about that, but I won't have performance anxiety about performance anxiety until the following week. That will be our next reading event on September 23rd. Um, and we're really excited. We do have a few folks who weren't able to make it tonight, but uh, will be joining us then. Um, and we're always just pumped for continuing, uh, you know, 31 and beyond. Um, and I don't want to totally end on a note that um, takes away from the joy that our readers have shared, but I do want to end uh, with a, a brief moment of remembrance. Our last uh, recording that you heard from Maria Sledmir, um, a Glaswegian poet, uh, today, unfortunately, was the day that our friend and poet, Callie Gardner, um, was laid to rest in the UK. Um, so Callie is an amazing, amazing poet and to remember Callie and to remember what the work they've done for the poetry community, the incredible poems that they've written. Um, I'm going to wrap us up and play us out tonight with a poem by Callie called Love and Rage and Rage. And I'll share a link with our video description to the anthology where you can read this poem as well. Love and Rage and Rage. One, waiting unbecalmed, I assist in tempestuous attentiveness. I work at the mailbox and see how we are here for the manipulation, the impression made with certain forbidden sharps. I open the hatch, look down. Something shouts back your worst contributions. It moves slowly, yet unpredictably with painful skin. Would I sew scarless hands on? I especially miss them today in this t-shirt weather of midwinter spring. And the data that has built up beneath us is subtle and perilous. Surrounds sound more like a sweet loss. And those it does not break, it just kills utterly. And I think a lot like, what if that were me? I need a new location, acquaintance. 
I will no longer be answering emails at this address and I need new words for all my feelings because they, I need a new pronoun for this, were misused. I need to be able to speak of your prominence and I need when you are knighted to be able to ride off into the forest. I need nobody and everybody to know what, who you really are like too. My friend says that you are one of the only people she would punch in the face. I don't want to punch you in the face. I don't want to punch anyone in the face. I know I should. Fascists and turfs. That I should find a red gym in my area. Get strong for the bashing back. But I don't. I want instead to learn to punch faces in a gentle but devastating way. Like modernity or a lifestyle blog or non-recyclable plastic. I want to make the enemy so anxious they crumple in the street, so depressed they can't leave their beds. Does the impulse then remain good and pure? Three, send needs through breakthrough speech, seeking arrangements that involve me being found in the clearing of violets and for the extreme motion against energetic sensations of new personhood. Love, too, be an incantation with infractions reversal upon terror sides. As bodies plots fireworks of coins, I feel like Ramona flowers, constant comment and Aries moon. And you, whom all my poetics have evaded, who gave me shit and took none in return, in the movie James Spader will play you. Whereas living motionless in the old world, wearing on how, like how we do, I pacify myself with sugar and guts. If I work back to the present without delay, we will get grievous and gross with it. Tongues heavy and salty and here to stay.